Welcome back to another episode of Struggle Creates Strength. Struggle Creates Strength is a mental health platform exemplifying that everyone has a story. I always say that no two stories are the same, but every story has the potential to help someone else. On today's episode, we are joined by 19-year-old Jenna Machos. When I first met Jenna, I could hardly believe that she'd ever encountered any form of mental health struggles in her life. She always had a smile on her face and she was such a happy-go-lucky person. So when she told me that she suffered from CPTSD, generalized anxiety disorder, and various other mental health struggles in her life, I could hardly believe it. I never thought that she would be somebody to struggle, but it just proves that everyone has a story and what you see on the outside is not always what you get on the inside. But she's here to courageously share her story and to help others see that it's okay to not be okay and it's okay to speak up about your struggles because your struggles don't define your future. Also, this podcast is sponsored by Raincoast Clothing. Raincoast Clothing is a clothing company based out of Vancouver Island, Canada. They represent nature by embracing adventure, spontaneity, and health, both physical and mental. They have also recently decided to join my mental health movement and donate 5% of profits from every item of clothing towards mental health awareness. Also, we have collaborated and created a Struggle Create Strength t-shirt, which has 100% of profits going towards mental health awareness. Go to raincoastclothing.com and help support mental health while getting yourself some great clothes. Now, I hope you enjoyed Jenna's story. And just remember that everyone has a story. Hi, Jenna. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. And I'm super excited for this podcast. I know that we've been going kind of back and forth about it, but I'm so glad that it's finally time. And I'm glad that we actually made this time and that it happened so shortly or I guess so quick if you will. But yeah, it's super exciting. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Like, I'm really excited. I saw the Instagram and I was like, I got to be a part of this. Like, this is so cool. And I reached out on a limb and I was like, yeah, like we're doing it. And it (laughs) happened. And I was like, hey. (laughs) Yeah, I know. That's so awesome. I mean, it's always nice when we can obviously have new people on sharing new stories. um, Because like I always say, everyone has a story. And Although no two stories are the same, every story has the potential to help someone else. And that's exactly what you're doing today is you're definitely going to help someone. And I mean, you never know who it is. You never know where they might be from, but you're definitely making a difference. And that's the most important thing. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think it's really awesome because when we start talking about it and we start making it more normal, it's just it gets easier to talk about it and it gets easier to tell people. Mm -hmm. totally yeah I know and that's I mean that's the whole point of it we're just trying to really normalize the topic of mental health and really just show people that it's okay to not be okay you can have your struggles but those struggles don't define who you are and they don't define where you will go so I mean just you speaking up you proving that basically that is the it's just it's amazing so thank you yeah thank you I guess I'll just get into it absolutely yeah 100% um Cool. So yeah, I guess my story begins quite a while ago, uh, back in elementary school. Um, My parents never really got along all that well. So my life was never really what I would consider good or normal at home. It was really just like a toxic place, a lot of yelling and fighting, but I didn't really think much of it. I was like, oh, everyone's house is like this. And there was the occasional time where I would go stay with my other family, but I didn't like really know why. And as I got older, I, it just got worse. And my dad, who I do thankfully have a good relationship with still, but he left and I think things really fell apart from my mom then. And that was really the beginning what I saw of her drinking problem. So my dad moved to out of town to like a more remote area. So living with my mom just kind of like made the most sense, but it definitely wasn't ideal. And my mom had times where she was amazing and times where she was really really bad and my other family they were like pretty involved at the beginning so there were times they'd come over and they'd intervene or I'd go stay with other people but it got to a point one time where they were like this isn't a safe place for a child anymore and they took me out and they put me I was technically in like the foster system like as a short term Mm -hmm. and I was going from house to house constantly so that my mom wouldn't find me because when she did find me it was bad and we were only allowed supervised visits and it was weird. It's like weird going to a room and they're like, here's toys. You can play with them while your mom's here. Mm -hmm. But I was like in grade six and seven. So I was like, I'm not going to like build blocks. Like (laughs) I know what's going on. 
And I think it was around that point where like, I really started to realize what was going on and it started to get to me. And I was facing like a lot of bullying at that time too. I think a lot of kids, like that's kind of like an age where it, it gets pretty bad for that for most people and it didn't really help. So I was so young thinking about it now that I started to have like some suicidal ideation and I would be like, you know, if this is what life is, like, what's the point? Like, this isn't good. And home wasn't really that happy place for me. And I didn't have a lot of friends at the time. And if that was the way my life was going to be, then like, what was the point? And mm -hmm. I did get to a point where I could that year go back and live with my mom. And they were like, no, it's good now. She's awesome. And I got back and it wasn't awesome and it wasn't better. And living with someone who like has addiction and who struggles with that is really hard. And especially when it's someone you love because it's like so hard to see them in that state mm -hmm. and things stayed at a place for all it was very on and off so it would be like really good for a few months and then it'd be really bad for a few and there was like never an in-between it was either like wow I have the best life ever or like wow this sucks mm -hmm. and when it would get to that point where it was really bad I was so scared to tell anybody because I was like if I tell someone they're gonna separate us again and I'm never going to get those really good times again so I was just kind of stuck in this cycle of like fear of like when is she going to fall in that bad state again and I kept with that state of like is this all life is for a while and I would make plans with my friends not really for the sake of like wanting to hang out with them I would be like oh like I guess like I was just looking for things to look forward to so I was like oh well I have to make it to this day because I'm going on a hike or like I have to make it to this day because I'm hanging out with this friend and my relationships definitely struggled because of that. And I wasn't as intentional with other people because I was just so focused on like making it to that day for the sole purpose of like having something happen in my life out of this like rocky routine at home. And the day would come and I would just like space out. It, like people would talk to me and I would be like, like I was just so unattentive in conversations and if I did get into a conversation, I would overshare so much. Or if like somebody said something I didn't agree with, I'd be like, no, you're wrong. Like, and I would just get so defensive. And I was like, and I'd get mad. I'd be like, why would you say something like that? And it would be like, they'd be like, oh, I don't like this TV show. And I'd be like, <laughs> I can't believe you just said that. And it was like, even like people would want to watch movies. And I'd be like, how do they think this is fun? Just like sitting here in silence and like relaxing. I was just like so uncomfortable. And I never really understood why I was that way. I was like, this is who I am. And I didn't like it, but I was like, oh, like, that's just me. And I did later learn it was from my yet to be diagnosed CPTSD. But mm -hmm. at the moment, I was just like, I don't understand me. Nobody else understands me. And I just don't fit in. Like, I'm just different. And a lot of, I got super anxious about that because I was like, nobody likes me and that is really kind of what led me, I think, into having this really bad anxiety. And it really stemmed from these interactions I was having throughout high school. And I could tell I was like never anyone's first pick to hang out with. And the fact I was having problems with my mental health, I think it really showed in like who I was. And I would overread every single interaction with people. I was like, oh, I'm going to be judged for saying this or doing certain things. And I just felt like people didn't like me because of who I was and it was hard because I didn't know how to fix that and like I didn't know myself and mm -hmm. yeah and like my anxiety it started to get really bad it extended into like school and just like everyday life I got really worried that if I didn't get a certain grade then I was going nowhere in life so I got like super hyper focused on school and my grades and I think people who went to high school with me they can definitely say that like I was like I always had my head in a book I rode the bus to school and I would do flashcards on the bus and I was like he will be like hey can I sit with you and I was like yeah just don't talk to me like I need to get these flashcards done for like the sixth time and I just felt like I was the only one fighting for me and trying to get myself somewhere in life so mm -hmm. I was just so worried about school and the future and I would get really anxious when I would go out with my friends like we would go out and I'd be like I can't be here like something's gonna go wrong I need to leave and People just thought I was overreacting and being annoying. So they stopped asking me to go out with them. And it's hard because like you see it on like Snapchat and stuff. And it's like, wow, like out of all those people, like nobody was like, oh, we should bring Jenna. So I started like having these really bad 
anxiety attacks at school because I was just like I don't have a place here like even like in like I'd get a bad grade and I'd be like what's the point of school like I have no friends I'm probably not going to like a university so I just got I just had so many anxiety attacks at school and that's when my mom when she was in a period of time where she was really good she noticed and we went to a professional and he was like yeah like you have generalized anxiety disorder like a hundred percent and I was like cool like it helped me clarify part of the reason why I was in just such great distress but having that diagnosis it didn't like help me get over it I would and I still sometimes do get super anxious at what just seems like the most random things like the dentist or like a flight and people haven't and some people still don't totally understand why I just get like scared at these things and like I was at the airport flying home for Christmas and I was just sitting in like the waiting lounge like bawling my eyes out and I was like the plane's going down because I'm on it and like everyone was looking at me like I was crazy and I like I just get so scared over the most random things and even now when I'm making plans with friends like I check every little detail to like cross things out on the list of everything that could go wrong in my mind and it's difficult because not everyone gets by like you have to make plans that way and mm -hmm. not everyone really sees but, like I like I can't control it I just can't like calm down and go with the flow like in my mind it's like well how are we getting here like how are we getting what are we going to eat like and people are like, it's fine. And I'm like, it's not, it's not fine. Like I can't go. And it's been so hard. It's been that way for a while, but it's just something that you kind of have to accept. Like, I can't control that. Like, I can't just be like, it'll be like, I'll just get in this car and go, it'll be fine. And that was hard. But then around grade 11, my mom's health and her struggle with addiction, it got really bad. And it got to the point where I didn't think she was going to make it. And it was really scary. And she ended up in the hospital for a while. And just going to like see her there and like seeing her like on her deathbed in the hospital. And like I was the only one allowed in because I was like her like the only immediate family who was there. And mm -hmm. it was like scary. And they're like asking me like what I want to do, like what I think her options are if she doesn't make it. And I'm like, I'm in grade eleven. Like I don't think I can make this decision on my own, but Thankfully, she like got out and she got back, but then she did get right back into drinking. And it was probably the hardest period in my life that I had with her because she started to take out these problems on me. And she would say, it's like my fault. She had a problem with alcohol or, oh, like Jenna, you're going nowhere in life. And like, you're worth nothing. And like, she'd kick me out and I'd be like, I have nowhere to go. So I would just like be like, no, I have to stay. Cause like, where was I supposed to go? <laughs> like, I couldn't drive. I didn't have a car. I was like, so I was just sitting there with her yelling at me all night, sometimes being like, get out of my house, get out of my house. And I go to school and act like it was normal. And it took me a while to understand that she became a whole other person when she would drink. And to hear your own mom say stuff like that to you, it really diminished my view of my self-worth. And I was like, wow, like I am worth nothing. Like if my own mom said it, like she's got to be right. And my family did try to help at the beginning and they were there for a bit to help her get in and out of like a few rehab facilities but it got to a point where they were just over it and they told me they're like we can't do it anymore so they just left me to deal with it myself so there I was and I'm like calling rehab facilities I'm like hey can you take my mom like how's the payment plan like how do you do transportation and I knew so much about the process and it was hard because I was just doing everything I'm keeping her alive I'm getting I'm like walking to the grocery store getting groceries I'm finishing the year off school and all while taking this mental abuse from her and it it sucked to be honest it really affected my mental health in a lot of ways because my family they could be like yeah we're over it but I couldn't mm -hmm. and I felt abandoned and just like left to survive and keep someone else alive like all by myself and I had feelings of jealousy too because I would be like I'd see some other people who I knew had broken home lives and they left and they'd go live with their friends or family. And even my own cousin, she had like one of her friends stay with her for a few years where it was safer for them. And I was like, I need to get out of here. Like I need to go stay with a friend, but I have nowhere to go. And if I leave, my mom's not going to make it. So like my support system left me and they left her and my, even my family who like took one of my cousin's friends. And I was like, can I come stay too? Like I, I can't stay here 
and they were like no like we don't have the room and I was like oh okay cool but it was just hard and it was hard too because all of my friends they'd always do all this fun stuff with their families and mm-hmm. I have never done family stuff like that and I never considered my home like a place where I'd spend a whole day and enjoy it and it was weird to like hear people talk about that and I was like you spent the whole day at home like decorating your Christmas tree like you're kidding and eventually my mom she got into a facility thankfully for like quite a few months down in Vancouver mm-hmm. and my family reappeared and they're like okay like we'll drive her down but she has to fly back and I was like okay like at least you'll take her down and it, we went down and did that and it was weird to drop her off and be like see you in three months like have mm-hmm. fun here it was weird and you see the place where they're staying and you just they're telling me all the information that I need to know and all the papers that I need to sign. And I was like, this is so not normal. This shouldn't be what my like grade 11 life is. But then we got back and I was just left at home all by myself. And it was weird to be living all by yourself. You don't really expect that yet in grade 12. And I had to become an adult really fast. And I turned to try and seem like cool and popular because nobody knew what was going on. And I felt like I needed to prove myself to make some friends. And I wasn't at a good place in my life. And I knew I wasn't a good person to be around. Like I didn't even like being around myself, but I didn't really care to make an effort with people because I like, I don't even know why I was just like, it was bad. And I was like, there's no point. Like no one wants to hang out with me anyway. And I started having all these thoughts that were once repressed, come back up and I was having like nightmares and like panic attacks about these events at home. And I just felt so detached from everyone. But I was like, okay, like I'll throw parties since I had the house to myself. And I fell into this lifestyle of partying all night and going to work all day. And like, not to say going out with your friends is bad, but like it got to a really unhealthy point for me. And on days that I didn't work, I would just sit in my room and I'd either dissociate or have nervous breakdowns for the whole day. And then I'd look and it'd be five o'clock and I'd be like, perfect, like time to have people over. And I'd like clean myself up and act as if a whole day, like nothing had happened. And it was weird. It was, a, it even felt weird for me to like have people over and just like pretend that I hadn't just spent like the whole day in this really bad state. And be like, hey, welcome. And just pretend like I was, I had the best day ever. And I was so positive and happy and At this time, I'd also been really involved in a church community. And as soon as I started living this lifestyle, they all kind of disowned me for lack of a better word. And they were like, oh, Jenna can't hang out with us anymore. Look at her lifestyle. And like, they even told me like, if you have a party tonight, we're gonna call the cops on you. So you can see how like bad it is that you're doing this. Mm -hmm. And it made it a lot harder because I think that was a community and a place that I probably could have used at that point in my life. And they decided that I just wasn't allowed to be a part of this church youth group community anymore. And I definitely had a crisis of faith through that time too. And I was like, wow, like God must not be real if he let all these, like he let this happen, he let all these people leave me. And it was a lot for me to process since before that, my faith was like my everything. It, like It was my whole personality. And that's like the one thing people knew about me. And it had kind of been like ripped away by others who were like, no, like you can't have this anymore. Mm -hmm. And there were some people that summer who were the only ones who I felt like were really there for me and understood what was going on. And when I look back on it, I have been lucky to thankfully have some people at every stage of my life who stuck by me, even if I didn't realize they were there. And it's interesting because I noticed it was the only people who really took the time to be like, if you like, are you okay? And like, of course I lied and I was like, yeah, I'm so good. Like, I'm great. But the only people who even thought to ask were the people who I knew also had stuff going on at home. And it's interesting because I think that's just like why it's so important that we're always kind to others because like, we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. And they were kind of the only ones at that time who really understood that because I knew that they had so much going on too. Mm -hmm. So it was just like, but it was so good that they, or at least asking me, but I was hurt that no one else really understood that, like, that no one else could see that I was lying and saying I was okay. And mm-hmm. 
I did have friends whose parents too would pick me up and they dropped me off just so I could get out of the house and just hang out with them. And I even had friends who their parents would make sure in a non-judgmental way, but in like a really welcoming way that I had food, they'd be like, hey, like, what are your plans for dinner? We'd love to have you like, oh, we accidentally made extra. I guess you have to stay. And actions like that, like really meant so much to me, especially like that was like the most support I had was someone being like, I made like an extra burger I guess you have to stay and eat because even then I was like what am I gonna eat like I don't know how to cook that good Mm -hmm. like I can I have food like I can make food but I it wasn't fulfilling or healthy in any way and Mm -hmm. stuff like that meant a lot to me and as much as I was embarrassed that people felt like they had to take these steps for me I was really grateful and I think it was stuff like that that let me make it through that period and I honestly, if like those people who, if I didn't have those people who welcomed me into their family lives so much, like I probably wouldn't be here today mm. because that was like, I needed that little bit as little as it was like, I needed that. And it was, I was embarrassed in this time too, to tell people like, oh, my mom's at rehab mm. because I was like, if I tell people, they're going to think less of me. So I just never really gave people a good reason why she was gone I think I told people she was at a wellness retreat finding her soul and they were like yeah cool and I was like okay because that's what we're going with and everyone believed it shockingly (laughs) and I got into a relationship at this time which was a really toxic relationship but my mom had come home and I was like okay maybe if my boyfriend at the time meets her and it's normal and it goes well other people can see my mom and They'll see she's doing well and it won't be something to be embarrassed about. So we made a plan and he was supposed to come meet her. And the day of, he was like, do I have to? Like, I don't want to meet her. Like, no. And I was like, oh, like, shit, this is something to be embarrassed about. Like, of course, people don't want to meet her. Of course, people don't want to come over. And I carried that weight of embarrassment for a while. And it was just another thing I was anxious about. Like, I was like, oh, he probably told everyone. And I walk up and down the halls at school and I'd be like, everyone knows, like, everyone must know and it was just so it was a lot to like take in and deal with and I think around that time too I just got really worried about everything and I would leave class in the middle of class just to go panic attacks in the bathroom and there were some teachers who I think could see something was going on they didn't question it but I did have some teachers who were like you can't go to the bathroom every class and I was like hey like I'm not going to straight up in front of the whole class be like if I stay here it's going to be bad So I would just walk out of classes and people were like, oh, like she's just rebellious. She just doesn't like school. And it was, no one really understood, but she was hard. And Mm -hmm. I randomly started to get worried about the way I looked at that time too. And I got super obsessed with my weight and dieting. And that boy I was dating at the time, he was like, you never go to the gym. You should go to the gym. Like you could use the gym. And I was like, oh, wow. And I was like, he must be right. And I would over-exercise in the worst ways. Like I would go for runs in the middle of the night. Like it'd be midnight and I'd be like, I should go for a run. So I would. And because I was so scared people would see me working on myself. And I was like, I just need to magically appear as if I look better. And I would wake up at like 4 a.m. and like do these workouts in my room and skip breakfast and then go to school. And I would be so exhausted and I was just really stuck and what seemed like this never ending cycle of like anxiety and perfection. And I would get so overwhelmed. And I tell myself like, oh, you need to work out now. But if you work out, you won't get your schoolwork done. And then you'll fail and you won't go anywhere, but you need to work out. And I just like battle it back and forth in my head all night. And then I'd be like, it's already 10 PM. Like now I can't do either. And it was frustrating. And yeah, and then I got out of that toxic relationship. And at first it was really bad. And this person I was dating, he'd show up at my house and he'd be like, if you don't get back together with me right now, I'll go kill myself and it'll be all your fault. And he'd be like, you're such a terrible person. You're the reason for all of my life problems. And it hit me really hard because it was really similar to the things my mom would say. And he would say these things and they're all words that I think still affect me to this day. And I felt like I was hard to love and I'm a hard person to deal with having around and I'm not enough for anyone. And those thoughts really took over my mind a lot then. And I had this suicidal ideation coming back and 
I live my life really risky. And I went through a list of all the people in my life. And I was like, how are they going to react if I was gone? And I, I know they'd react bad, but in my head, I pictured it. And I was like, they're going to be fine. Like no one would care. And I got to a point where I was at such a low and I was so empty and I didn't think anything in life could get any worse. I would really collapsed. I had a hard time going to school. I skipped a lot of classes and I wasn't taking good care of myself. Um, they give you in school, like you can see all your absences for the year. And I looked at my grade 12 one and there was like over a hundred and nobody ever asked if I was okay. Even my school counselors, I'd be like, I'd go and have a conversation about my schedule at university and they're like, you need to stop skipping school kind of like, it's really bad. Like, I don't know if you think it's cool, but you need to stop. And they didn't really question that maybe something else was going on. And everyone just thought I just didn't like school. And cause I put on this big happy front for everyone. And everyone's like, oh, she's so positive. She's so happy. Like, she's just like trying to like put on this like cool act. And there was really just so much more going on. And I was going, over my head a lot at that time about all these failed relationships with my friends and at what the time felt like a lost relationship with my mom and I realized that I had a relationship to myself and I wasn't taking care of that relationship and I was like if everything else seems hopeless and like a lost cause like I have no other option like this is the one relationship I might be able to save like my self relationship and focus on me a lot and do what I need to do for myself because there's no way it can get worse than this if it goes wrong and I think that's really when things started to get better for me and I really got to know myself and I spent some time figuring out what my actual opinions were on things and learning who I wanted to be to others and how I wanted to be somebody who treats people like they're so important and needed and that I wanted to like be somebody who I would have needed. And I learned a bit more about like what my triggers were and when I needed to leave a like situation. Like I learned that I don't do well with people yelling at me and that I take criticism really seriously. And Mm -hmm. I had to, and I'm still learning how not to do that. And it's a process, but I got to know myself and my mind and I was able to realize like what was going on a bit more. And I moved to Edmonton for school after that year and I got this chance to start over like now that I understood more about what was going on in my life and I felt like I'd learned what loving myself meant and I saw that I had this life and this life was worth fighting for and I was on a good track for a while but then last year I was sexually assaulted and it was super hard at first and it felt like a really big setback with my mental health and my roommate at the time they were all friends so she kept bringing this person over And I'd have these really bad anxiety attacks and I'd tell her these things and she just wouldn't understand because they were friends. And she was like, no, like it's fine. And I just felt so alone. So I moved and I got out of that situation. And then I was confused because I was still having these really bad reactions. Like I was having nightmares and panic attacks and I was associating a lot more during the day. And I was super on edge with people, but that wasn't unusual behavior for me since it's kind of regular stuff that I faced and I still do sometimes face so I blame myself for everything a lot I was like well if these are usual reactions for me then like I must like I'm just stressed with school and it must all be my fault and my old roommate she kind of like teamed up with these people for in the reporting process and they made up the story that made it seem like it was all my fault and I started believing that story and I was like wow like how could this, how, how could I have this be my fault? And it was a dark time. And I started facing those old problems again, like suicidal ideation and not eating. And I was upset because it seemed like I just gotten on this really good track with myself. And it was like, I failed at getting my life back together because I was back at stage one, but I went to my university's sexual assault center. And I honestly didn't think it'd be more than somebody willing to sit down and listen to me, which still would have been great, but I was so happy that it was so much more. And they got me set up with a psychologist because I was still having some bad reactions. And on my intake, like right away, they were like, 
I don't think it's just PTSD from this. Like you have like CPTSD from everything over the years. And I was like, I've never heard of this. Like what is CPTSD? And she kind of gave me the rundown and I was like, wow, like it made more sense suddenly everything. And it made sense why I didn't get why I would act in the ways I did because she told me that I would probably repress a lot of my experiences. And I was like, oh, you're right. Because for me, I didn't remember stuff until they came back up until like anxiety attacks or nervous breakdowns. Like I, like I can't just think of in name of a lot of experiences with a lot of detail because I've just like really buried them deep in my mind. And it did help me make more sense of the fact that this rape or whatever, it just triggered a domino effect of sorts. And that helped me learn how to deal with it though, because I know, and I knew how to cope with my mind a bit more, which was good because if I didn't, I think it would have been a lot worse, but I started like being proud of myself for the little things. And I like use my planner religiously. And I still kind of do now because it's like putting a check mark next to like, oh, I went to class. I'm that just feels like such a big win sometimes. And I think looking at it back when that first happened and being like, look how many wins I accomplished. Like I'm doing good. I'm on track. And like, I think I've taken some extra time in my days to just like focus on me and put all the schoolwork down and stuff like that's really helped me from going into like this crazy downward spiral. And obviously like my mental health, it's still something that I'm dealing with and working on, but I know how to keep it on track now. And there's times when my anxiety gets super bad. Like even I had my first in-person class a while ago and I got so anxious that I like threw up in the parking lot and I think it's one of those things that not a lot of people realize that it can affect your body too. Like I'll get really bad headaches or I'll get really bad muscle aches and I get bad like stomach pain and nausea to the point where like I have exam accommodations for it now and they give me 15 minutes to like go when I need and just like calm down. Because last year, like my first semester of university, I would be like, I'm gonna be sick if I stay in this room and I just hand in my test and leave. And my grades really showed that. It showed that I wasn't writing the test. I would answer one question and be like, I can't be here. And I think just like resources like that are really important. And I think it's helped me to see how many resources are out there for me. And yeah, it's like not something that's gonna disappear, but I think I know now what I need to do more so to like deal with it and be in tune with myself and yeah. That's like my, my story. I feel like I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> no, you're good. No, <laughs> no, you haven't. And honestly, like that is amazing. And I, it's, I would never guess half the stuff that you've been, <laughs> which is like crazy. Like I obviously haven't known you for very long at all, <laughs> but just from the conversations we've had, it, it's so so evident how genuine you really are and how like like your past has almost helped basically form you into who you really are and I mean I say that the same thing with with myself as well like all of my past struggles have really kind of shaped and formed where I'm at today and they've helped me become a better person because of it and some people it's kind of the opposite and some people they really dwell on it dwell on everything that's happened to them and like you said, like even um, sometimes they think that God just put them on this earth to not succeed. And I just don't, I don't think that's true at all. I think everyone obviously has the potential to achieve whatever they want to achieve. And um, I think it's in those really bad, dark times, it's coming out with coming out and chasing like the light at the end of the tunnel and just really seeing the positive in it and seeing um, more so what these struggles are actually teaching us rather than, again, dwelling on them and looking at them in such a negative way. It's good to look at them in a positive way. And I mean, just from, even from hearing you say, like when you really realized that you had a relationship with yourself and that is, I think that's so pure and something that is amazing because there isn't a lot of people realize that they have a relationship with themselves. And 
Sometimes it's even in a very negative way where they look at it and they say, I have a relationship with myself, but it's a very negative relationship. So to actually look at that relationship and want to build that relationship and work on that relationship with yourself is so important. And I think that everyone needs to do that. I, I mean, I always have kind of struggled with that. I think sometimes I'll just look at the things I'm doing or where I'm at in my life. And then that's how I base my relationship with myself rather than actually just seeing who I am and having like, even just having almost like a bit of a conversation with myself as as crazy as that sounds. It's something that you kind of have to do sometimes. And I mean, there's a lot of times, even when I've talked about the fact of looking in a mirror and there's, I mean, you can hear it in a lot of motivational speeches as well. And they use it and they say like, if you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, you are the one that can change that. And I think it's more so like if you look into the mirror of your life and you don't like what you see or you don't like the path that you're on or where you may be heading towards, I think you have the ability to change that and you have the ability to kind of manifest your mindset and turn it all around and actually get yourself on the path that you want to be on. And I mean, there's a lot of things that are, there's a lot of things that can play or come into play with all of that. And obviously a huge one for that is anxiety. And I mean, I'm a person that has very bad anxiety as well. And um, so like, not to the extent of you, like, and some of the things that have happened with you, but um, I can relate to some of those things. And it's, it can almost hold you back in some sense. And it can really get in the way, but just to see how you've kind of overcome those things. And you're actually working around it. And like you said, with how now you for exams, you get 15 minutes. That's like, that's such a positive because that obviously proves that you kind of took it within yourself to add something into your life that needed to happen to allow you to succeed. And it's with anything like for, for anybody add so many things into your life that'll allow you to exceed at a different level and a different way. And yeah, it's, it's amazing to see for sure. But um, I have a question for you and that's about the CPTSD. So I actually had recently, I had a girl on that talked a little bit on CPTSD and now like I, after that podcast or sorry, before that podcast, I had no idea even that like CPTSD was a thing. Like I had no idea that it existed and then starting to learn more about it, you start to see honestly, how there's probably so many people that are walking around with CPTSD, but just don't talk about it, or maybe don't even have the education behind it, or don't even know that they have it. And kind of talk about how you really realized that it happened with you, like that you were diagnosed with CPTSD. Yeah. Um, so like I went and I was able to see a psychologist because they recommended me to see one from the sexual assault center and they were like they can help you with your PTSD like PTSD and I was talking to someone and I was like telling her like what was going on the girl who was kind of like my advocate from the university and she was like yeah like I definitely want to get you set up with a psychologist and I was like okay cool Mm -hmm. and on your intake they ask you like your family history and everything and she kind of dug into parts that no one else had really dug into before like she was like how was like your home life growing up like oh like that must have been hard and like, she got me to tell her more about like my mom and about that relationship and about friends and she just like poked those little questions to get that information like I probably wouldn't have given someone before like she almost like knew it I think she knew coming into it mm. she almost knew exactly what to ask and I had no clue what CPTSD was before I knew that this home life had affected me negatively and I think she explained it to me like it's just like a lot of things built up over the years it's Mm -hmm. with PTSD she said it's kind of more like that one thing and it's that like one event that really affects you but CPTSD it's kind of all of them combined and she said it was really common for people who come from these like broken homes that have had a lot of damage over the years be more of like a CPTSD thing than a PTSD just because it's like constant and there's all these different events and like I can't even like pinpoint the little things that came out I don't even know how she got 
that information out of me, honestly, but there were events that I had forgot happened. Mm -hmm. Like I had forgot times where just like crazy things would happen at my house. Like I forgot about the police coming and being like, get away from the windows. Like you, and I was like, this is really intense. And events like that were stuff that I had forgotten about and that I had repressed so deeply in my mind. And I was like, this is weird. Like I forgot about all this stuff happening until now. And she kind of explained it like, you bury it deep in your mind and mm-hmm. it's just all these things that are just so deep and like locked down for you that they're not things that you really think of and that's why it can be really confusing and that defensiveness I would get with people and that dissociation I would get when I was with people it made a lot she said that that was from I see PTSD probably and that really helped to kind of shine a light on that because those are things that I didn't know related to that before I was just like wow I'm a really bitter person but yeah I guess just I was really lucky that she was able to explain it to me so clearly and so well because I had no clue it was a thing either and Mm -hmm. I listened to Kaya's and I was like wow like I really relate to a lot of this this is cool like there's actually someone else who has this like this is a real thing because I've just been going off of this like one girl's diagnosis and I tried to look into it more myself but yeah I think it's one of those things that isn't talked about enough and even if you like google it because I was like hey like what is this what is this thing that I have and there's not a lot of information out there on it either which is hard Mm -hmm. but yeah yeah I think I think that's even the thing is like it's so important for us, obviously, to normalize the topic of mental health. But it's also important to kind of dissect that and see what people are actually affected by, and then normalizing those topics as well. So it's not just normalizing the topic of mental health, because that's essentially just the health of your mind, right, (laughs) of your mental state. And, but there's so many different doors to open and so many different things to touch on and educate people on. And CPT, CPTSD is one of those. And it's something that, I mean, I'm super intrigued by and something that I obviously love to hear more about because for me, there's like with anything that, like any of the topics that people bring up on this podcast, for me, I almost kind of put my, put all my past struggles and like kind of together and see if maybe I, am in that category like and it's it's not like anything that I am ashamed of it's just like I'm actually genuinely curious like maybe I do have this or maybe I do have that or this is like when people explain stories I oftentimes go like wow like that's me as well I wonder like and then I I go through all these states as well where it's just like a constant kind of a constant state of wonder and I'm like do I have this do I not am I on the same level as this person or not? And it's like, it's so interesting. And I mean, anytime that somebody brings up a topic that isn't talked about a lot or something that most people aren't educated on, it's so, so interesting to hear about and intriguing, honestly. And I think, I think that's, that's something that you are going to help a lot of people with as well as just your story and seeing, um, that you were diagnosed with CPTSD from it. I know that there is a lot of people that have similar stories or can relate to your story in some form or another. So for them, it might be a big awakening and a big, like kind of like that light bulb going off in their head. Like, wow, like this is what I have, or like, maybe this is what's going on. And cause there's a lot of people that don't understand what they're feeling or what they're going through. And so when they can hear somebody that has actually seek professional help and they know exactly what's going on. It's so helpful for so many people because then they can sit back, take a step and say, wow, like I think I have this as well. And then they go seek help. And then it's like, it's just a big snowball effect, honestly, of everybody (laughs) like, like seeking proper professional help or at least acknowledging what may be really going on inside their minds and where their mental state is truly at rather than just pushing it under the rug and brushing everything off and never looking at never blinking an eye at it again but um no I think it's I think it's amazing talking about new topics and topics that aren't talked about enough and even like you said if you search it up on the internet and you can't find a million things on it then I think 
the best way to kind of get the information across is to have somebody like yourself who actually has it and speaks on it and talks about it and in such an open and vulnerable way, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like, even she told me I had it and I was like, well, why doesn't it exist on the internet? Like, why <laughs> does it auto, like it auto corrects to PTSD. And even if you add the like complex and it's like, now, nah, like, that's not even a thing. And hearing Kaya talk about it, I was like, okay, like, I'm not the only one, like mm. someone else has this. It's not just me. And exactly. I think too, like as much as what happened, that that diagnosis sucked mm -hmm. it's uh, it is like a way that I grew from that struggle and I was like it opened a door that I don't know how long it would have taken mm -hmm. to be opened otherwise so it was it's making the most out of it I guess as terrible as it is no absolutely um just I have a couple little questions mm -hmm. before we kind of start to fully wrap it up but yeah. um, what would be kind of like your biggest your biggest tip of advice to somebody that is struggling or may struggle with mental health struggles in their life? Yeah, um, I guess, first of all, you just really have to know that like you're the most important person in your world and you need to treat yourself like you're somebody worthy of love. And I got out of this really toxic relationship and dealing with not feeling loved by my mom or the people around me, it, really made me feel like, oh, I'm not worthy of love and I'm not worthy of having healthy relationships. And mm -hmm. it's a learning process, but I had to learn to treat myself with respect and compassion and kindness. And you have to give yourself credit for every step that you make. And you have to be kind to like yourself and your body and your mind. Like I learned that I need to limit my caffeine and sugar levels or else my anxiety goes kind of crazy and that I need to include healthy exercise in my day or else all that stuff kind of gets built up and we're all human and mistakes are normal. And you kind of have to move these walls out of the way that prevent you from fully loving yourself for who you are. And you have to appreciate the struggles in your life that have brought you to where you are. And I think we all these really great things that make us up and they wouldn't be these things that make us up without things that have happened to us. And mm -hmm. I was really distracting myself for a while and taking the small amount of courage to realize that I've made it this far and there were times I didn't think I'd make it this far, but I'm still here and I'm alive. And it's just blocking out those things of the past and accepting the truth about them, like not blocking them out completely, but like blocking out that, oh, it's such a terrible past I had and just kind of being like, this happened and I'm growing from it. And also that like, you just don't have to struggle in silence. Um, there's people out there who are willing to listen to you and there's resources out there able to help you. And when I first went to my university's sexual assault center, I didn't think it would be a lot, but I was really amazed at the resources that they gave me. And they gave me somebody to advocate for me and getting the academic and professional help I needed and the assistance with stuff that goes beyond that and reporting and all that. And I'm so thankful that I reached out to just that one resource and reaching out to professional help and just getting that assistance because you're not alone and it can be scary and it's easier said than done but you're not going to be judged for asking for help like I was so worried for so long that nobody would understand me and I had to realize that it was okay that I was upset about my life and what had happened in it and my feelings about that were valid and being hurt about that stuff it's okay like it's not like being okay with your mental health means that you're like not upset at all about the things that have happened in your life. Like, obviously if you've been through some traumatic experiences, you're not going to be like, Oh, I'm so, I'm so happy about that. Like I'm not even a little bit upset about it, which is something I think society wants us to do sometimes. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's okay to ask for help and it's valid to be upset and about that. And, yeah, it's just, it's, you can't discredit the way that you're feeling and think that it's, oh, like, oh, I shouldn't be upset about it. I don't need to get help. I'm just going to pretend like I'm fine because it's, it doesn't work. And mm -hmm. there are people out there who are going to understand that you're feeling that way and they're going to stand with you and support you. And it's hard to be at a constant battle with yourself and you can't let it tear you down. It's okay not to be okay. And it's okay if you're going through something and you need help. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, even like for myself and through my whole journey and on my continuing journey, um, I think that's one of the biggest things is really realizing that like you need to come first. You, ha you can't love somebody else if you don't love yourself. You can't give everybody exactly what they want. You can't please everyone. You can't take, a, take care of anybody else if you're not taking care of yourself. And I think that's just where it all comes down to it is like you have to put yourself first and you have to take care of yourself and you have to really like tune in with yourself and realize what is a huge positive and what's a negative and what's impacting your life in a positive way what's impacting it in a negative way and what's going to allow you to be the best version of yourself and what's kind of stepping in the way of allowing you to be the best version of yourself and I think that's that's like cool. I mean, I could go on and on and on about this sort of thing because that really interests me. But I think moral of the story is that we have to really focus on ourselves and we have to really help others realize that they need to focus on themselves as well. I think there's so many people that feel that the only way they're going to be happy is if they are making millions of dollars or if they are in a relationship with someone or they have, I don't know, they go buy a bunch of stuff. Like, I mean, there's so many things that like so many people do on a regular basis just to fill that void of happiness and falsify their happiness and do something that is going to make them happy when in reality, it's just, they don't know what they're doing because they're not taking care of themselves. They're not really accepting. Um, they're not really accepting what's going on in their life. And they're not really like tuning in again with how they're feeling like truthfully. So it's, yeah, it's, like I, I love that factor of it. Um, but what's uh, what would be a quote that has kind of shaped your life or that you kind of live by or that you've seen and has ultimately like allowed you to get where you are today yeah um I think I kind of have two um one that I've definitely thought of more lately and I have it like up in my room it's and here you are living despite it all and mm -hmm. there's times when I look back on my life and I'm like it's wild how much I've had to carry and to realize that I'm still here it's really amazing and mm -hmm. yeah there's times I'm like am I gonna make it through and it felt like life was fighting against me that the odds weren't in my favor but like here I am I'm enrolled at a university I'm not spending every single minute of every day having nervous breakdowns and I'm able to meet people a bit easier now without instantly putting up this wall mm. and thinking they're just another person will hurt me and I've made it through so much before and I think a lot of us have made it through crazy things before and you can make it through again and mm -hmm. whatever kind of comes my way like I know I can make it through and I've made it through and I not that I just made it like I'm relatively happy and I'm living a life that I try my best to fuel with joy and positivity and it's not perfect by any means like I do still have worries mm -hmm. and I still have mental health things going on every day but you can make it through and you'll grow from it and be so much like more stronger and wiser and more capable mm -hmm. and that like life is worth living and you're worth life too and I think another one I think of a lot is that you can still love yourself and be a work in progress mm -hmm. because life started getting better for me when I started putting myself first and I got to a point when I was at such a low that I didn't care anymore what anyone else thought or had to say and at first I was looking for instant success but I had to learn to be proud of myself I guess for like climbing one step up the ladder rather than waiting to give myself credit for making it all the way to the top and mm -hmm. I still have these times now where it hits me and I'm like I'm not at a hundred percent and I still have things going on and it's okay though that I'm still working and dealing with that and mm -hmm. it's okay that I'm not perfect and even after I was sexually assaulted I was like I'm back at square one I failed and those setbacks don't they're not failures. Mm -hmm. Like you can still love yourself for working through it. And I think we forget that a lot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we really lose ourselves and you just need to work on you until you feel like 
you again and be on that because like loving yourself it's like a process it's not just like the end goal mm-hmm. like you, you, it's something that you have to keep going mm-hmm. you kind of just told the story in my life <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it's hilarious because I, I like I'm the same way I think I like there's been times when I've felt like this is exactly where I want to be I'm right on the right path and then next thing I know I'm totally off the path and I'm like what is going on and then I get back on the path and I'm feeling good and groovy and then all of a sudden same thing fall off the path and then it's just like that constant battle and I think the biggest thing that I have learned through all of those was or I guess kind of the thing that I've taken away from it I should say is that now I have so much more knowledge than I did back then I like say there's a specific point in my life like I'd say probably like a year ago and I thought there was no way that I would kind of get better there was no way that I would feel like good like I was kind of convinced that I was just gonna kind of feel crappy for a long time or until I like moved on until I was finding like wife and kids and doing all the, <laughs> the whole like future thing and then it kind of like over time, I started to realize that I've, especially like through this like platform, I've learned so much from so many different people, which is honestly like helped me immensely. But I think it was more so that I kind of what happened with me is I started taking little tools from all the things that I was encountering and then seeing like even myself, like seeing myself grow, like it was kind of crazy how much I would grow and how fast I was kind of growing. And it's like, obviously really satisfying to see yourself grow and see yourself kind of push past some of your barriers. But then when you do slip back, it, it's like heart wrenching. You're like, Oh my gosh, I don't want to, I feel like I'm losing it. I feel like I'm back at square one. And then just over time, you really realize that you're never falling back to square one because you're constantly learning. You're constantly seeing Uh, new sides of yourself and you're seeing like what it takes to get to where you want to be and I think with every single failure it's just another lesson learned and then you're like as you go on it's all you're doing is learning and learning and learning and then eventually you sit at a place where you know that if something comes your way you're going to be able to conquer it and if you slip off the path you're going to be able to get back on it and that's basically what we're doing. You're not saying that your life is going to be perfect every single day because it's not, it's really impossible to have the perfect life every single day. But I do think that you can obtain the, the proper tools to actually keep yourself on track and at least keep yourself hopeful and knowing that you are going to be okay and you are going to be successful. And just because you have a slip up doesn't mean that's doesn't mean that's the like your future it doesn't mean that that's where you have to go and where you have to be which is again I think it's pretty cool but um again I could ramble on and on and on but I honestly I think um I think your podcast will help so many people and definitely give people a better insight on even their own lives and if somebody does want to reach you or get in contact with you have a conversation of with you maybe even ask you some questions where could they actually reach you at yeah um honestly any of my like social media I'm on there all the time my Instagram's just Jenna Makeshaw's like Mm -hmm. shoot me a message I'll answer it pretty quick probably give you my number probably and Mm -hmm. yeah like I I felt really alone I think a lot and it's if you have no one like you at least you can reach out to me Mm -hmm. like Ali I'm here and there's a lot of other people who are here too. It's mm-hmm. so like, don't be afraid to reach out. Like I'm, I'm around. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that's awesome. And again, I can't thank you enough for coming on the platform, for actually reaching out and for most, like basically the biggest thing ever is helping others. And that's what you're doing today by obviously being on the podcast, by sharing your story and by essentially just possessing the most vulnerable, but courageous part of this whole thing so thank you so much yeah thank you for like giving me the opportunity to I think of course 
good that we're talking about stuff like this and exactly. making it okay. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's so important and we're just going to continue to grow the platform, continue to grow basically our community and constantly having vulnerable conversations with people, really getting people outside of their comfort zone, but in the best way possible. And again, thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll keep in contact lots as we, as you know, I guess we have lots of really exciting things coming up. So yeah, I'm excited for it. So absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I'll, uh, yeah. I'll talk to you shortly. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of struggle creates strength. I hope everyone enjoyed Jenna's story and I encourage you to reach out to her and have some vulnerable conversations with her. If you want to reach out to me or come on the podcast, you're more than welcome to at struggle creates strength on both Instagram and Facebook. You can also reach me on my website at struggle creates strength com. All podcasts are posted on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, and additional posts are posted on Instagram as well. Be sure to share the podcast and be sure to share the platform with your friends and family because you never know who may be struggling and you never know who may need that open environment to speak up and share their story. Thank you so much for listening and just remember that everyone has a story. Uno, dos, tres.